So welcome back to the Fairly Lame Podcast. My name is Dom and we're already up to episode 15. We're absolutely flying through this. We're building a bloody empire. One of Australia's greatest all-time exports is the Fairly Lame Podcast. Australia's favourite feel-good conservation podcast because I think we're the only one. But hey, hey, you got someone's got to be the greatest, you know what I mean? Uh, each and every week, if you're new here, each and every week we go over only feel-good, positive, uh, environmental conservation news stories, not only just about Australia, but all around the world, depending on when we can find them. Uh, and apologies, if you can hear my laptop, I don't know what is going on, I don't know what it thinks it's doing, literally just has some Chrome tabs open, and not even that many, not even that many, but it sounds... It sounds like my room is an airport. So hopefully the old uh, road is doing a fantastic job of cutting out the uh, background swirling, the old jet engines coming out of the Lenovo. Shout, actually not shout out Lenovo. Whatever the opposite of a shout out is, do not get yourself a Lenovo. I got, I got bloody hoodwinked. I went into JB Hi-Fi. This is only a year old too, because I thought probably need a Windows for stats and all that for university, right? Because on Mac, Again, this is very niche, but on Mac, absolute nightmare trying to run uh, this mapping software or like geospatial software, I guess, called ArcGIS, right? So you had to use a, uh, what do you call it? Like an emulator and then use a VPN to run off the Deacon system and it was horrible. I, my keyboard couldn't work. I, like, I could use, like, two letters. I think it was I and P for some reason were the only letters on my whole keyboard that I could use. So, for anything I had to write, I had to write it down. Anyway, so I bought a Lenovo, thought it was the best. Went into JB Hi-Fi. It was only, like, I don't know, 1800 bucks. So, it's pretty good, especially compared to MacBooks. And then I remember I got it home, and I was like, fuck, I actually just got a Windows. Um, I mean... I don't know. Yeah, and anyway, anyway, it had all these, like, grouse specs. I mean, not a computer guy at all, but here it says uh, Core i7. And it had all this, like, good RAM, fancy RAM, whatnot. Ran it through my, uh, or past my computer science buddies. They all said it was great. So, I don't know, maybe I just got a dodgy one, but, oh, my Lord. It is trying to edit videos, too. We're going on a tangent, but trying to edit videos on this thing, you, it literally looks like you're watching in super, super slow motion. Like, it's just, uh, it, uh, uh, and it's just, we're going through the horrors. But that's what it takes to bring you incredible people, the Fairly Lame Podcast. Uh, and I think there was something else I was meant to say at the start of this. I can't remember. But for today's feel-good stories, so... Hemp swimmers, sure, we've all heard of those, how sustainable they are, apparently they produce a nice little lather when you get them, uh, get, <laughs> get them working, but apparently hemp concrete, or hempcrete as they're calling it, is now a thing. Then, Indigenous, or Queensland's Indigenous Women Ranger Network wins an Earthshot Prize, and if you're like me, you might not know what the hell that actually means, we'll have a look at that, uh, and that is actually very impressive. Then the state of the Great Barrier Reef, and I'm sure you don't need to be told this, it's not incredible, but we are a feel-good positive uh, podcast, so we are going to be looking at the bright side, what it could mean. Um, we touched on it briefly last week, but we'll go a bit deeper this week. Then the success of mammal conservation here in Australia for bilbies, bandicoots, and potaroos. And finally, what are carbon sinks? Uh, some people, I don't think I'd ever understood the term before I studied environmental science. Maybe that's just me. Maybe everyone is much more up to date with the uh, climate lingo than I was. But we'll have a bit of a look. Um, you know, what is a carbon sink? What are they? Well, where are they found? Why are they important? Um, and yeah, just a whole bunch of whole bunch of wholesome news for today's stories. Uh, but for our oh, that was going to say all the links. And the timestamps for all these articles are down in the bio or description below. So if you want to skip to a certain article, maybe you're a Bilby fan, you want to skip to our third story, fourth story, feel free to do so, as well as all the links as well, if you want to have a bit of a read, because we're not reading the full articles, um, just the more juicy parts. Uh, and I, I think I will preface this by saying we'll try to read the article first, and then I'll add my two cents afterwards, so it's a bit easier to follow along. Because I feel like sometimes it can be confusing if I'm reading out statements and then I start saying, you know, the opposite or whatever. Um, it, can, it might be hard to tell who's who that's coming from, you know what I mean? So for our first story, Hempcrete gets a boost in US residential building code. So in October 2022, Hempcrete, 
uh, concrete made with hemp uh, was added as an appendix to the U.S. Residential Building Code. So hempcrete is described as an energy-efficient, low-impact, water-smart building material that offers a smaller carbon footprint than other home building materials. Uh, the herd or shiv of the hemp plant, I don't know what the shiv is, uh, is oh, keep reading, Dom, uh, is the woody core left over once the fiber has been stripped away. The herd is slightly coated with hydrated lime and water, and the resulting mix is placed into formwork on the wall. The material is stable in the wall immediately after tamping. The finished insulation is left exposed on both sides of the wall in order to dry. The hempcrete provides a dense, flat surface and makes an ideal substrate for plasters. Hemp is a low impact crop and most importantly to this tree hugger, it stores about 325 kilograms of carbon per metric tonne. However, there are questions about the total amount of carbon sequestered because of the lime that holds it all together. And I'm assuming that's just in reference to the fact that lime's mined, so it might not, it might take away from the, uh, I guess, overall net gain of using this product because uh, some of it was mined that has its own uh, environmental impact and emissions um, So also on tree hugger they put out a really good article looking at the benefits of building a hemp creek home So hemp creek is a energy efficient low impact water smart building material that offers a smaller carbon footprint than other home building materials an alternative to concrete which is very energy intensive hempcrete can be an integral part of home building using just enough energy to keep its occupants warm in the winter and cool in the summer like any house material hempcrete has its share of advantages and drawbacks while it's a good insulator it's not the best load bearing material it can handle moisture well reducing the possibility of mold growth and the attendance poor uh, indoor air quality in homes however it uses a lot of water to grow what is chiefly important though uh, to many environmentalists is that hemp plant is used to make hempcrete absorbs carbon and is relatively easy to grow and harvest so cement is the big energy user in the process of making concrete it is manufactured from a range of materials such as limestone shelves chalk shelves shells rather chalk shale and clay these ingredients are heated to high temperature to form rock that is often then ground into powder. Hempcrete, on the other hand, is made from hemp mixed with a lime binder and water. It does not require heat to be produced, and this material can be formed to fit between the studs of a house as building blocks or bricks. Hemp can also be used to protect the outside of walls uh, from new and existing homes from moisture. As a vapor permeable material, it can absorb water when it's raining and expel it when the sun is shining. See, I don't know too much about building a house, believe it or not. But um, surely, surely you don't want your house to absorb water. Wouldn't you want it to repel water? And how how can it be good for mold if it's holding on to more? Like, maybe it dries it out, but surely if the material's wet. You know what I mean? Anyway, uh, apparently this is a huge advantage for many building materials as moisture problems can lead to mold and rot. But, like, surely if it's absorbing vapour... Then it, it then it'd be more inclined to rot, you know what I mean? Because it's moist. But anyway, apparently there's potential for hempcrete panels to play an important role in commercial construction, where the great fire performance of the material, the benefit of being coated in lime, can provide a biogenic uh, carbon storing option for large buildings that does not carry the fire performance concerns of dry biogenic insulation. And apparently biogenic just means uh, a biogenic substance is a product made by or of life forms. It is absolutely possible to design, construct, repair and maintain highly performing, energy efficient and durable buildings with not only low or zero embodied carbon materials, but with materials that sequester or store carbon, giving that building a net positive carbon footprint. And there's some confusion. Some people call... Uh, offsetting more carbon or capturing more carbon than you produce carbon negative and some people call that carbon positive but it's just a good thing either way uh because you'd rarely hear i'm yet to read anywhere that meant that in a negative term for example i haven't seen any company that produces more carbon than they store car call themselves uh carbon positive i've only heard it about the other way they say carbon positive because it's like 
a good thing, whereas carbon negative sounds like a bad thing, but it actually means that they're storing more. Hopefully that's not too confusing. Um, but yeah, that terminology can definitely get mixed up a few times. And I think it might be a country thing too. I heard some people say, I mean, again, maybe it's just me, but apparently in America, they say carbon positive. And then people saying, well, maybe carbon positive has a different meaning in Australia, where I'm from. So maybe, maybe, again, maybe that's just my interpretation of it, but I'm pretty sure that's, I mean, again, in this example, it sounds like that's exactly what's meant. Um, anyway, our buildings then become tools in the project of global drawdown of CO2. They become reservoirs of CO2 and help reduce and reverse climate change effects. Hempcrete is one of those materials that can contribute to regenerative carbon storing buildings. So get those farmers planting hemp now. We need a lot of it in 2024. So again, that was pretty interesting. I definitely had to double take when I read that article. But hey, I mean, if it works, it looks really strange. Uh, again, so apologies for... I was going to I was going to search for apologies. Uh hempcrete. Uh apologies for those people listening on Spotify, but we'll just have a quick look at what hempcrete kind of looks like. It looks like so you, you apply it in a spray or bricks, right? Um and it kind of just looks like solid bricks of plant matter like it looks like there's little like you can tell it's made out it looks like rice it honestly that could be one of the great comparisons of all time it, it kind of just looks like a brick made out of rice yeah sure it actually does though that, that's a fuck it that's great i'm a genius but for our second story today queensland's indigenous women rangers give an earthshot prize for protecting the great barrier reef the group was awarded $1.8 million and praised as an inspiring women-led program using First Nations knowledge to protect land and sea. The network was awarded the Revive Our Oceans category of the prizes, which was launched by Prince William and David Attenborough back in 2020. And if you're like me, I'd never heard of this before. It is a pretty, as you can tell, 2020, it is pretty recent, but... What is the Earthshot? So, the Earthshot Prize is awarded to five winners each year for their contributions to environmentalism. Surely Fairly Lame one day. Imagine if Fairly Lame Studios wins a bloody Earthshot Prize. Anyway, uh, it was first awarded in 2021 and is planned to run annually until 2030. Each winner receives a grant of £1 million to continue their environmental work. There's five categories... Uh, and yeah, it was launched by Prince William and David Attenborough, and the winners are selected by the Earthshot Prize Council, which includes Prince William and Attenborough. So over on their website, uh, so these are the five categories, uh, obviously one per category per year. So the first one, protect and restore nature, clean our air, revive our oceans, which is what these uh, ladies want, then build a waste-free world and fix our climate. Uh, and this is a nice little quote from Prince William who said, The earth is at a tipping point and we face a stark choice. Either we continue as we are and irreparably damage our planet or we remember our unique power as human beings and our continual ability to lead, innovate and problem solve. People can achieve great things. Like the felt nah. <laughs> uh, the next 10 years uh, presents us with one of our greatest tests, a decade of action to prepare or repair, rather, the earth. So, what did they do? The initiative was described by the Earthshot Prize as an inspiring women-led program that combines 60,000 years of First Nations knowledge with digital technologies to protect our land and sea. Only an estimated 20% of Indigenous rangers in Queensland are women, and the program, established in 2018, has trained more than 60 women, many of whom have subsequently found work as rangers or in conservation uh, in Queensland or elsewhere. The Earthshot Prize describes the program as vital. The data they have collected has given us crucial insight into one of the most important ecosystems on the planet. As custodians of the land, the rangers have also protected sites of great cultural and spiritual significance. With greater support, Indigenous women rangers could span the planet, helping repair ecosystems from Hawaii to Nepal and Tanzania. And so this is, I guess, the point of the podcast. So it could go one or two ways, but we got to be hopeful, right? Be optimistic. So uh, as we touched on last time, uh, in last week's podcast, episode 14, uh, the Great Barrier Reef is in danger. The United Nations World Heritage Committee drafts 
a draft report finds rather. So that in the draft they said uh, or they suggested that the Great Barrier Reef should be listed as a world heritage in danger. Um, and so that has a few implications. I think there's some economic. Uh, I think you get funding. I'm not fully across the ins and outs of a world heritage site, but I think there's some economic incentives. Uh, to upkeep a world heritage site half for the tourism and to say that it's a world heritage site but i think you also get a bit of bunsen a bit of cheddar cheese a bit of money um but again i could be wrong and so australia responded uh to their findings this was back in 20 oh back in june rather oh june of 2021 so yeah it has been going on for a couple years Anyway, this was Australia's response. So, Australia will challenge the proposed recommendation, uh, according to a statement, uh, and it said authorities have been stunned by a backflip on previous assurances from United Nations officials that the reef would not face such a recommendation prior to the UNESCO World Heritage Committee uh, meeting in Japan, uh, or in China in July, rather, and are concerned about a deviation from normal processes in assessing world heritage property conservation status. Status? Status, rather. Miss Lay said the draft decision had been made on the basis of a desktop review without adequate consultation. The Great Barrier Reef is the best managed reef in the world, uh, and this draft recommendation has been made without examining the reef firsthand and without the latest information. So I'm not going to lie, I was pretty... I'm not too sure how true that statement is about the Great Barrier Reef being the best managed reef in the world. Um... Maybe, again, maybe, maybe it is true. Maybe it is the best managed reef in the world, but it's just going through a bit of a hard time, you know what I mean? But anyway, that's not the point. What the point is, so another great article over on Tree Hugger. So we'll just learn about why the Great Barrier Reef is in danger. Um, and I guess the the hopeful side of this is that hopefully, <laughs> a lot of hope in there, but you got to have hope. If you don't have hope, what do you have? Uh, hopefully... This potential listing as a world heritage in danger will compel leaders to actually act uh, more, maybe, or more strongly or more uh, efficiently in a more timely manner to uh, have some large, meaningful impact uh, on the Great Barrier Reef. Not only just investing in coral spawning projects, restoration projects, but on climate change in general. So, as you probably know, the Great Barrier Reef is in trouble. About 50% of the reef's coral cover has already been lost, and the general agreed-upon estimate is that it could all be gone by 2050. The thin silver lining is that, because of the reef's plight is so dire, it's receiving a surge of attention in the form of research and rehab. The Australian National and Queensland State Governments uh, together spend about 200 million Australian dollars every year to protect the reef's health. Uh, and in April 2018, Australia's Environment Ministry uh, announced that 500 million Australian dollars will be set aside for reef preservation. Report, uh, reportedly, the largest ever single investment for that purpose. While many experts say this still isn't enough, the efforts are ongoing. So here's a closer look at what makes the Great Barrier Reef great, why that greatness is at risk, and how people are trying to save this natural wonder before it's too late. So shout out to Tree Hugger, or they're doing the positivity for me. But this massive area isn't just ocean with some coral here and there. The reef is comprised of 3,000 individual reef systems, 600 tropical islands, and about 300 coral caves. This complex maze of habitat provides refuge for an astounding variety of marine plants and animals. From ancient sea turtles, reef fish, and 134 species of sharks and rays, to 400 different types of hard and soft corals and a plethora of seaweed. And so there is quite a bit of information in this article breaking down the, just the ins and outs of the Great Barrier Reef. So again, uh, it will be down in the description down below if you want to have a read. Highly recommend. Shout out Tree Hugger. So, the future of the Great Barrier Reef. What comes next for the Great Barrier Reef remains a big question. Many organisations working hard to minimise a wide range of dangers. And the good news is, at least some of those efforts seem to be working. Like we've already seen last week's episode, or maybe episode 13, 
Uh, Coral, spawned for the first time ever at Australia's first underwater nursery. Uh, back in 2018, Tourism and Events Queensland announced a positive update that some effective areas, affected rather, areas of the Great Barrier Reef showed significant signs of improvement. It's clear that we need to act quickly to prevent this natural wonder from fading away. And for anyone who has gazed upon that turquoise water and its richer... I can't say there's too many W's in that last sentence. I've stumbled so many times. Rich array of wildlife. Even if it's only in pictures, there's no doubt that this place is worth fighting for. And there's heaps of incredible stuff going on at the Great Barrier Reef. Um, A lot of it has to do with heat tolerant corals. And so bleaching events are kind of just like... Because what causes bleaching is higher water temperatures, right? So whenever there's a bleaching event, it's because water temperatures have increased for one reason or another, whether it's certain currents or sea levels, all that kind of stuff, right? And so a lot of the work that I've been, I guess, reading about is to do with making corals more heat tolerant, uh, either in a lab or out in the water by using corals, like we saw last week, using corals that survived previous bleaching events, meaning that for whatever reason, they're more adapted to survive uh, warmer temperatures, right? So then it's just a bit of the old natural selection working for you. Shout out Darwin. But there's kind of two types of stresses, maybe two to- well, like categorically, right? So you've got press stresses and pulse stresses, right? So press is something that's constantly, constantly there, constantly putting pressure. So for example, uh, a press pressure may be, or a press stress, maybe a road going through some habitat because that road is constantly there. It's constantly putting pressure on the nearby habitat, whether it's from sound, uh, you know, the any uh, oil leaks, stuff like that coming out of cars, roadkill, all that kind of stuff, right? But then there's also pulse pressures, which is something like coral bleaching, floods, fires, which it comes, but then it goes. It's not constantly happening. Um, but then pulse stresses vary in intensity and duration in terms of how... Uh, how intense the fire is, how hot it is, uh, how quickly it moves, all that stuff, and then the duration, how long the fire is going for. Same thing with coral bleaching. And so I think a lot of work is being done, and again, I'm not I'm not going to talk about something that I don't know because I feel like I do that enough already, but they've had some excess increasing the lifespan by a couple weeks, but it's the repeated coral bleaching which causes the most harm. If it's just one, one off, you know, here and there, most of the corals, from what I've seen, can recover in adequate amounts of time. It's not that harmful, but it's just because they're becoming more frequent that even the more heat-tolerant corals are finding it hard to keep up. And yeah, so that's a bit of, uh, I guess, my knowledge on the importance of coral reefs. But so before we get into this next feel-good story, it would mean the world to me if you could please make sure to like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, but also head over to fairly lame underscore on Instagram. It's going to be the hub for all things fairly lame, just feel good, environmental, conservation, eco-friendly news stories, whether it's brands, organizations, articles, anything, clips from the great podcast, all that good stuff going to be found over there five days a week, post my favorite feel good stories from the day, as well as much, much more. So yeah, all links down below, but let's get back into the podcast. Our next story, staying on the topic of climate change, global warming, You hear the word, at least I hear the word, carbon sink thrown up a lot. And I didn't really know what it was. I just think back to year 12 biology, the old sink and source for phloem, the plant uh, sugar, the plant nutrients, you know what I mean? So a sink, a sink of plant nutrients is the orange, but a source is the leaf, right? (laughs) Hopefully that, mate, hopefully that's right. Comment below, any botanists down below. Um, Anyway, so I don't know, I feel like a lot of lingo is thrown up and... Some people, including myself, you kind of just, yeah, okay, that sounds like it's important. We'll run with it. But it's like, why is that important? What does that actually mean? So, again, tree hugger, shout out. So, what are carbon sinks and how do they impact climate change? These ecosystems help maintain a balance between our planet and the atmosphere. So, a carbon sink is any natural system that absorbs and stores more carbon from the atmosphere than it releases. 
The largest carbon sinks on Earth are forests, soil, and the ocean, with the latter already accumulating 30% of the atmosphere's total carbon dioxide emissions. So why are carbon sinks important? So carbon dioxide is released through natural processes like when animals breathe and during volcanic eruptions, as well as human activities such as burning fossil fuels and chopping down trees. Carbon sinks are nature's way of closing the gap between what carbon is released and what is stored. Carbon dioxide is the main greenhouse gas responsible for climate change. As CO2 envelops the planet in greenhouse gas molecules and traps the sun's heat, it causes the global temperature to rise. Higher levels of carbon emissions mean more elevated temperatures. Since human activities produce increasingly more CO2 than the natural carbon storage process can handle, it is vital that nature's carbon sinks remain protected. And an incredible example of a carbon sink, I think the largest, outside of the ocean, the largest carbon sink is the Amazon rainforest. I think it stores enough, it holds the equivalent amount of carbon dioxide that all humans produce over four to five years. And on top of that, uh, biodiversity reasons, because we love animals here over on the Family Land Podcast, uh, over three million species live in the rainforest, both plants and animals, and over 2,500 tree species, or one third of all tropical trees that exist on Earth. Shout out, Amazon. Also, some good news about Brazil. Again, last podcast, highly recommend. A lot of interplay, a lot of back and forth, a lot of linking between podcasts. I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but... We're here now. So, soils contain mineral particles, broken down plant matter, air, water, and even living organisms. So, this means that they retain a large amount of carbon that those materials, predominantly plants, have taken from the atmosphere previously. Soils can store this carbon, which would have otherwise returned to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide for a very long time. And I think what is meant by soils contain mineral particles and that, because that kind of slipped me up the first time. I think that's just talking about because they like literally just hold it, like, because rocks, obviously everything's made out of carbon, right? Even this microphone. Um, But because the soil actually holds it uh, and holds all these different nutrients. It's not saying that these nutrients are good for global warming, anything like that. It's just saying that they purely exist in the soil and that's why they're a store. So that kind of confused me the first time I read it. But peatlands are wetlands where waterlogged conditions slow down plant decomposition to create carbon-rich soil or peat in abundance. The carbon from plants already absorbed from the atmosphere is then naturally stored within these peat soils, helping to mitigate global warming. And though peat soils cover only about 3% of global land surface, they contain over 600 gigatons of carbon and represent 44% of all carbon, making peatlands the world's largest terrestrial carbon sink. There you go. It's not the Amazon. Maybe the Amazon's just like for one ecosystem, you know what I mean? Whereas peatlands occur all over the world. There's this thing called the Blue Carbon Lab, which try to works out how we can use blue carbon ecosystems so like peatlands and mangroves and all that to help uh, sequester carbon in the most effective way, whatnot. Uh, And they had this test. I don't know if it was called the tea bag test, but pretty much you'd bury two tea bags made out of, I think they might have been plastic tea bags. Anyway, yeah, they were. They were plastic tea bags. Uh, And the reason was you'd bury two and you'd bury them in all these different locations and you'd see over time which one had the most tea left into it. And the reason why you want the most tea is because you want the slowest decomposition because decomposition releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. There you go. Plants and forests also absorb carbon from the atmosphere through photosynthesis, which then becomes deposited and stored in forest biomass like tree trunks, branches, roots, and leaves. Large areas of trees and forests act more significantly as carbon sinks simply because of their size and longer lifespans. Grasslands also sequester a large amount of carbon. In places like California, where forests are more greatly threatened by wildfires and drought, they could be considered more reliable carbon sinks than trees. And so this kind of confused me, because surely grasses die quicker in drought than forests, you know what I mean, and trees, you know what I mean? So like, even think of at your house, if you've got grass out the front, after it rains, Super green, but then, especially in Canberra, you have one hot day and it starts to go brown. And and even with fire, like some trees, a lot more trees would survive a fire than grasslands. Or maybe, I don't know. Uh, Yeah, that was 
Very strange. Anyway, uh, the world's oceans play a huge role in carbon sequestration, both by dissolving and absorbing carbon dioxide from the water and also through photosynthesis by phytoplankton, seaweeds, and sea grasses. Microscopic plants called diatoms, which apparently is just like a type of algae, uh, have been found to absorb 10 to 20 billion tons of carbon dioxide each year simply by floating on the surface of the ocean. What? How the hell? How the hell does that work? How do how do how do uh, diatoms uh, absorb carbon? How the hell does that work? Um. So apparently they actively take up carbon dioxide. Uh, and then the shells of diatoms are so heavy, shells of algae, that's a bit strange, um, are so heavy that when they die in the oceans, they typically sink to their watery graves on the seafloor, taking carbon out of the surface waters and locking it in the sediments below. I have heard that before, but I didn't know that they were so amazing. But then also coastal vegetation, which we've talked about so much on the Fairly Lane podcast and will continue to. So coastal vegetation like mangrove forests are also massive contributors to global carbon sequestration, typically referred to as blue carbon, since the soils of marine plant habitats have a significantly higher rate of carbon absorption than terrestrial ecosystems. And because they're underwater, they don't burn down. When climate sinks, I think there's meant to say carbon sinks, uh, are damaged or destroyed, for instance, as fires raged in the Amazon forest, or when excess carbon in the ocean causes the water to become acidic, these ecosystems may stop absorbing carbon altogether and even emit stored carbon back into the atmosphere. Ocean warming, for instance, affects the ability of marine ecosystems to absorb CO2 because warmer water naturally absorbs less carbon dioxide and because it stresses marine habitats that are designed to survive in cooler temperatures. And I think that last part is talking about it stresses these marine habitats so plants may die and then when they decompose, they release their stored uh emissions it's been a very beachy podcast very oceany podcast which isn't a bad thing love the beach but change gears a bit to something else that i also adore big fan of turning the tide of extinction australian mammals are coming back bandicoots bilbies and potteroos so for all those rooting haha uh, for, <laughs> that's throwing me that uh for australian wildlife there are reasons to jump for joy as several endangered marsupials begin the road to recovery in their native habitats Starting with the world's most endangered marsupial, four male and two female Gilbert's potteroos were released into the great southern region of uh, Western Australia. After being threatened with extinction from a bushfire that reduced their numbers to 100, an insurance population was established on Bald Island, and a specially fenced off area within Way Chinny Cup National Park. So, the great Gilbert's potteroo, if you don't know what potteroos look like, Think about a mixture, a three-way mixture between a wallaby, a rat, like a bush rat, like a chunky rat, and a bandicoot. And I think they hop. Yeah, they hop too, if that helps, but they're tiny. Uh, they're only, they're, what, 7 to 12 kilos, head to head and body length is around 28 uh, to 37 centimetres. So, the Gilbert's potteroo uh, is critically endangered and is a small rat kangaroo marsupial on the south coast of Western Australia that was once considered extinct from the early 1900s until it was rediscovered in 1994 at Two People's Bay Nature Reserve, east of Albany. It is considered the world's rarest marsupial and one of Australia's most threatened mammals. So from these populations come six pioneers which will hopefully lead to a rapid recovery in Two People's Bay on the slopes of Mount Gardner, Western Australia. The potteroos were fitted with GPS trackers and radio transmitters. We'll be able to find out where they move to, what they feed, and where they sleep. Potteroo researcher Tony Friend said, The tracking is important uh, because we hope to learn if the potteroos can use the area that was burnt back in 2015 uh, as the vegetation is not as thick. And vegetation, super important for these guys, provides them protection from avian predators, whether it's eagles, all that fun stuff, but also, uh, you know, duck in between a couple shrubs and whatnot to run away from foxes. 
Australia's small marsupials can breed fast if food is plentiful and they are not overhunted by feral cats and invasive foxes, something that conservationists in New South Wales working with the Golden Bandicoot are seeing. Uh, these smaller marsupials have been locally extirp extirpated, extirpated uh, from far northwest uh, for over 100 years. And then, uh, so there's a little information about the Golden Bandicoot, but we're jumping the gun a bit. We have another article lined up about that. So we'll jump down to uh, this Wild Deserts Project, a project from the University of New South Wales uh, that reintroduced bilbies, another marsupial extinct locally for over 100 years, back to the Sturt National Park up in, or back in 2020. So indeed, the uh, $40 million program has saved and expanded seven other species beyond the golden bandicoot and bilbies. And it's not only leading Australia, but also the world. We're turning back that tide of extinction. We're bringing back bandicoots, bilbies, and numbats. A recent trapping campaign to count how many golden bandicoot joeys were among the breeding females showed absolutely flourishing populations. Wild Desert Project Coordinator said the project has more species on the list and are working through approvals on what animals to reintroduce next year. And so, the Golden Bilby, I mean, look at it. If you're listening uh, audio only, highly recommend jump on Google. Have a look at the Golden Bilby. It is adorable and it could have one of the most magical, most mythical names of all time. It sounds like it's enchanted, like it's something out of bloody uh, Lord of the Rings. Anyway, so Outback Golden Bandicoots rapidly reproducing in western New South Wales after formerly being locally extinct. So as a part of the Wild Deserts Project, uh, 27 of the native marsupials were translocated from Western Australia and released in the Sturt National Park. They have an incredibly short gestation of only days or weeks and most of their development is in the pouch like a joey kangaroo. They are ejected from the pouch at a fairly young age and obviously are maturing really rapidly to then reproduce themselves. And this is where it starts to get a bit interesting, so stay with me. The project has feral animal-free areas, but there are still cats and foxes uh, and rabbits that can put the native fauna in danger. Uh, with the increased rain, it can still mean a boom-bust environment for native and feral animals. Unfortunately, a feral cat climbed over the bloody fence uh, and did some uh, damage. And then they said, we're working on getting cat populations in there, not out, they're not trying to remove cats, they want to add cats. So we can start trialing releases of bilbies into an environment where they can be exposed to low levels of feral cats and they can learn what they are. Ultimately, our goal is to see these animals beyond these fenced exposures and living uh, in a wider environment where feral predators are controlled or in controlled densities. Uh, Mr. Pedler said that the project has more species on the list and they're working through it. So, I don't know, I was a bit taken back by the idea of adding cats into these areas. But I get the logic because it's kind of like with the cane toad. As we've seen, the incredible uh, ibis, the great bin chicken, underrated bird, one of the great birds of all time. Um, honestly, it, their, their ability, on like a serious note, their ability to adapt to human environments, incredible. Same with the pigeon, the pigeon's doing great. And it's not a hard, it's not an easy place to live. So if you're that common in human modified areas, you're the goat. Uh, anyway, so adding cats in does make sense because, like the uh, bin chicken, the ibis, they've actually learnt over time how to eat uh, cane toads without getting poisoned. Um, which, you know, you can do your own research on that. There's a good article on it. I just didn't really want to go through it. Anyway, and you even see this over in, I think it's Indonesia or Malaysia where they do some orangutan work, right? They rehab orangutans, where they throw stuffed snakes on the ground and then the caretakers uh, and the other orangutans start screaming and sprint away from the fake snake to teach babies that snakes are bad. So it's that kind of thing. So I do understand the importance of, you know, you need the exposure. And there's been some talk about having fake cats, like stuffed cats and doing that, and that didn't work. Uh, and I assume that these cats wouldn't be able to reproduce because then if they reproduce i mean it is a fenced enclosure so you can do so you control it a bit better because there's not that much going in and out you know what i mean um but then if you've got animals in there that you need to take care of like endangered animals that's a whole other thing so i'm assuming they won't be able to reproduce so they can't establish because then <laughs> fuck then you've got a enclosed area of just invasive species and then you know that's not a great situation to be in anyway but look 
So there's a lot of great things going on around Australia. We have, we've been very Australian focused the last few weeks, but I guess climate change is affecting everyone, believe it or not. Some people don't believe it, but it is here uh, around our uh, round earth. Um, but yeah, if you're from another country, please comment below what good uh, conservation stories, what good organizations, projects, whatever are going on in your country. I've got about 30 websites that we're monitoring. I like to say monitoring, makes me sound very scientific or like I'm a policeman. Um, but yeah, it's very hard to find it for overseas, especially in America. I don't know if it's just where I'm looking, but it doesn't sound like there's a whole heap of good going on over there. But I'm sure there must be, you know what I mean? There must be. There must be. Anyway, this has been episode 15 of the Fairly Lame Podcast. Much appreciate you guys for listening. Make sure to head over to Instagram. Honestly, shout out. My new Instagram feed is looking grouse. Shout out Dice Digital. Gave me a free bloody audit, whatnot. Got some great covers going on. We'll see you guys next week. Hopefully you have an incredible week. Keep up fighting the good fight, and yeah, have a great day.